Davy, how's it hanging? Better than expected. I'm starting a new book. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name's Stonesy Boy and welcome back to Reading with Stonesy. What's that? It says chapter one to five, that's a new. That's a new thing. There was a small inconvenience with reading. Um, and that's because I actually almost read a different book. And then after looking into the book, I found out it's political. We can't have political books in our channel because every other friggin' reading channel has it. Uh, and the gay boy kissed the other gay boy, and the dad who didn't want her son to be gay exploded into fire. The end. Yeah, I don't read those. Um, but yeah, we're reading Minecraft Zombies. Uh, but yeah, this is new, right here. Chapter 5. Look at this, woo! Look how new it is. I don't know if I put it back in the same place, but still. Um, we are reading Minecraft Zombies. Page 1 to 21. What? Oh, right, because chapters. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to stick them up. Stick them up. Now, stick them up. All right. So, without further ado, sorry for the long 1 minute and 31 second intro. Let's begin. Well, it's probably not minute 31 for y'all, but still. Let's read uh, the starting thing. <clears throat> For John, gone but not forgotten. Minecraft Zombies. Chapter 1. It was dark, moonless night, when a stranger came into Plain Town. Bobby was done with her daily chores, and her baby brother was fast asleep. For the first time all day, the house was still and quiet, and Bobby found her gaze drifting out of her bedroom window. She saw movement beyond the torchlight. At first, she thought it was her eyes playing tricks on her. It was hard to see anything in the night like this one, and when the moon was blocked by dark clouds and torches set up around town, you only served the deep in the sad shadows. She grew closer to the window. She squinted in the darkness. There, she'd seen light. It wasn't a trick of the flickering torchlight, but it was Shepherd's Ellis' sheep running loose again, and the person moving out of there. It was the movements of their strange. They shuffled slowly forward, reaching out with both arms as if for balance. Bobby thought it might be a zombie. She heard stories about the mindless, rotting creatures and the putrid green flesh that sunk in black eyes. There were dead things that stalked in the night and prey upon the living. It was revolted and curious. She learned in closer for a look. As she watched the figure, it seemed to be tottered and sway, like baby, little baby Johnny had been taking his first steps, when it stumbled as if tripping over some feet and dropped to the ground right beneath a lit torch. In the light, Bobby could see a figure clearly in the first time. It wasn't a zombie at all. It was a boy, and he didn't need help. Bobby's parents honked in protest as he ran past them and threw him open a door. She ignored them. She knew very well that if it wasn't rules for the villagers to leave the safety of their homes and the sun went down. But she also knew that she'd be forgiven the breaking rules if it helped someone in need. Hello, Bobby said to the approach of the fallen figure. Can you hear me? I'm Barbara. Bobby. Uh, the figure raised his head. Poison, he said weakly. The chill word showed Bobby in a court. Poison. What if that someone had done this on purpose? I need to get you to a cleric, he said. Do you think you can make it? It isn't far. And she took his arm and put it around her shoulder. Helping him back to his feet, he took shuffling, uncertain footsteps. It was long and supported his weight. She knew he wouldn't fall again. And she didn't let him fall. Plain Sound's temple was only a few doors down in her family's home. It didn't bother knocking. Cleric every surprised by the intrusion, rushed to the stone stairs and questioned her. He's been poisoned, Bobby explained. The cleric grumbled, gesturing toward the table. Bobby helped the stranger climb on top of it. His iron armor clanked against his wood surface. And the bright interior light of the temple could be... He how bad he looked. No wonder he thought he was a zombie. He looked half dead. Claire gave her examined the boy honking their conclusion at Bobby. Wither, she said, doing his best to understand the cleric's gestures and utterances. Is there a cure? Do you have a potion? The cleric's answer surprised her, but she knew better than to ask if they were joking. In Bobby's experience, Claire Gary didn't tell jokes. Bobby ran out into the night, heading to the northernmost edge of the town. That's where the animals were kept. Two sheep, twice as many chickens and cows named Daisy. Bobby had never milked a cow at night before. But this is an emergency, and although Daisy gave her a funny look, the cow didn't complain. As soon as Bobby returned to the temple, Clavery forced the stranger to drink the milk straight from the bucket. Did it work? Bobby asked impatient. Will he be all right? The cleric grumbled in response. The worst of the danger was over. The milk had cured the wither poisoning, and the stranger was still weak. He needed rest. In other words, it's time for me to leave, said Bobby. I can take a hint, cleric. But she hesitated on her way out of the door, turning back to smile warmly at the villager. Thank you for the help. I knew I could count on you. Cleric grumbled again, uncomfortable with her jet... Until the cleric 
like most of Plainstown's residents, did enjoy surprises, interruptions, and any other sort of deviation from their daily routines. And tonight's events were certainly unusual. Adventurers came through the village very often, so usually to trade for goods and use a crafting station. This was the first time an outsider had really need, truly needed the villagers' help, though in Plainstown it delivered. Bobby felt a rush of pride and satisfaction. She basked in the glow of the good deed she'd done well. He might feel differently, but she only known the trouble that my stranger would bring into her life. Chapter 2. Bobby was good at mending fences. She had a lot of practice. Plain town was sleepy and simple and small, but it was located right in the heart of an open grassland with no trees or hills or mountains on the side of the view. Bobby had never seen a village in a great distance, but she could imagine it was visible for miles and miles, especially at night when its torches would twinkle the stars against the landscape in dark as ink. At night was when the monsters from freely. It, she would hear them sometimes as she lay in bed trying to fall asleep. The click clack clattering of the walking and stalking of skeletons, the hiss and scuttle of a spider that skittered across the roof. Once, she even seen an enderman walking around the living room, and it made strange noises, proved some of her parents' furniture around her, then disappeared in the shower, a purple starburst. They didn't sleep a wink that night. Then, then there were the adventurers. Unlike villagers, adventurers had no permanent home and no real responsibilities. They wandered from place to place, and from what Bobby had seen, they had always prioritized manners along the way. They cut into holes, into walls, and fences to save walking just a few steps. They took whatever they liked from villagers' chest or garden and left their trash behind. They got into fights with monsters or with each other, oblivious to the damage they caused. Bobby wouldn't understand that. She would never go around breaking other people's things. But as long as the things are broken in plain town, she'd be there to mend them. There you go, Shepherd Ellis, she said, and she set a final piece of the fence into place. She used oak so that a repair job would naturally rest of the fence and everything else in the village. Aside from the bit of stone, a wall of plain town was made of oak. See? You ain't can't even tell there's any ever any damage. Shepherd Ellis hemmed and hard at the garbled language of the village. Bobby hadn't played closer attention to the, get the gist of what the shepherd was saying. She nodded patiently, squinting in the sunlight. They can't go on far, they never do, she said, but I'll find your sheep and bring them back, I promise. As Shepherd Ellis turned and to expect the repair job, Bobby strolled south, down to the dirt road and ran through the town. She raised several neighbors as they milled around the town square, and there were large oak trees stood right in the center of the village. They called it the Heart Oak, and villagers often gathered beneath it to gossip about other... Before the day's work began. Good morning, folks, she said when he waved back. The village temple stood across from the tree. Bobby stepped inside it, calling out, Cleric Every, it's me, Bobby. The cleric looked up from a brewing stand, and there was some new potion bubbled and boiled. Where's our guest? asked Bobby. Is he feeling better? The cleric honked and gestured around the agnetation. He took off, Bobby said, and left his garbage behind. Bobby picked up a stack of discarded dirt blocks on the floor inside. So much for gratitude, she said. I guess we just have another adventure after all. Bobby slipped out of the door to continue her rounds. He visited Fletcher Lee who was running low on feathers, and Mason Bradley, who proudly showed off the stone that he polished to the shining. Cartographer Haven's house appeared empty. Hello, Bobby called. I'm just checking to make sure you got good on supplies. There was no answer. Bobby looked inside the cartographer's chest, and he found almost out of bread, and she had to bake some today. And then she lingered, looking around the bright room, and there was a cover colorful space with paintings and potted flowers in a back bookshelf. She spun a needle in the desktop compass and examined the large map that had been affixed to the wall. Plain Town was only the smallest dot upon the map. It was almost impossible to fathom that everything Bobby knew would fit into such a tiny place. The world was so big. And the ocean. Nearly a third of the map was devoted to a swirling expanse of blue. And now that there was so much water in all the overworld, Bobby was so engrossed in her thoughts that she almost didn't hear it. A shuffling sound. The tiniest movement. Bobby wasn't alone. Hello, she said, turning around in a circle. She didn't see anyone. She stopped and listened. She could barely hear it, but it was there. The faintest sound of breathing. Hello, she said again, alerted at the sign of movement. Is someone there? With a gleeful gurgling noise, a small figure launches over Bobby. Leaving from the top of the nearby bookshelf, Bobby screeched into the surprise of the figure wrapped around his arms around her. Caught off balance, she stumbled, landing flat on her bottom. Her attacker laughed as they fell, squeezing her tighter. She's been attacked, Bobby realized. It was being hugged. It was her baby brother who was involved in an easy mistake to make. Johnny, she cried. You almost gave me a heart attack. Her brother gurgled happily, as if he just won a game that Bobby hadn't realized they were playing. He hugged them back, and was an instant later, she ducked out of her embrace to run over to the desk, where he proceeded to climb into the disagreeable reason. What are you doing here, Bobby asked him. Do you want to make masks when you grow up? I bet you'd be a great cartographer. She watched to see if he would pick up a compass. At the moment, he seemed to be more interested in his own two feet. Bobby liked to imagine what her little brother might be grow up to be. He saw potential clues in everything he did. Tap dancing on an anvil? Maybe he'd be a blacksmith. Cuddling up with a tuft of wool? Maybe he'd take over the Shepherd Ellis one day. 
As he watched Johnny jump around in the front of his leg of the map of the overworld, she felt relieved to know one thing is certain. Johnny might be adventurous, but he'd never grow up to be an adventurer. It simply doesn't happen. Villagers were villagers. Adventurers are adventurers. And one couldn't become the other. A good thing, too. Just as the thought of being partnered uh, with brother made her heart hurt. The cartographer Haven appeared in the doorway, harumphing about the commotion and shooing of the siblings back inside. Sorry, Bobby said, laughing at the cartographer, shot the door in the face. It's bad, baby, Bobby said and wagged her finger. She was smiling as she said it. Do your parents know where you are? Do they even know you left the house? Johnny giggled before turning and wandering off. To get out of habit of wandering, Bobby tended to find him in the strangest places, climbing on roof, balconies, chasing chickens, or jumping on beds. Bobby assumed it was a normal behavior for a baby, but it was exhausting to keep him up with him. She once spent an entire day trying to track him down, only to finally discover him napping inside the leather worker Shane's cauldron. Shane still had to give him dirty looks, and Bobby couldn't really blame him. She watched him now and toddled up in the town golem. The goalie was Gentle Giant, the construct carved in the iron who kept the watch over the town. Bobby slept in the sounder. Knowing that Goy was there, always alert, always ready to protect the village and its inhabitants from any danger that found its way into Plain Town. Goy stood at the head taller than any villager, and twice as tall as Johnny. It was broad shoulders and long, powerful limbs, but Johnny wasn't intimidated by the golem. As Bobby watched Goy live for the flower, a right red poppy, and Johnny, afraid, walked up and plucked the tower flower from the gi Iron Giant's grass. Remember your manners, Johnny. What do you say? Prodded jo Bobby. And when it was clear that Johnny had nothing to say, he turned to Goalie. Thanks, Goalie. Without a mouth, Goalie didn't respond. In fact, it was impo usually impossible to know what the Goal might be thinking. Bobby just thought of the Golem's eyes glimmering whenever she spoke to it, though. Johnny ran off toward home, probably plotting all sorts of mischief on the way. But at least he was headed in the right direction. Bobby continued south, to the outskirts of town and beyond. The dirt road through the village ended up on the field grass of dandelions, just past the library. Away from the buildings, Bobby knew... View stretched for miles across to the flat grassland, where there was literally no place for Ellis's sheep to hide. Bobby saw them grazing beside a small pond. Conveniently, there was fresh shoots of sugar cane growing along the pond's edge. Bobby could use them to make sugar or baking, or perhaps she could also make a gift for fresh paper for the cartographer to apologize for her brother's antics. She broke the sugar cane apart with her hands, stashing the material in her inventory before turning the attention to the sheep. Come on, Bo, come on, Peep, and she said, Vacation is over, time to go home. Bo grazed mutely at her, and Pete bowed definitely. Although, she might have sounded backward, it was hard to tell the sheep apart. Oh, fine, we can, we can take a minute, said Bobby, and she settled down a bit beside the water. You're just as stubborn as Johnny, and anyway, what's the point of trying to run off? What's out here that's so great? She stepped a hand over the plain, which went nearly as far as the eye could see for the final coming to an end of the distant mountain range. Bobby sighed. I'll tell you what's out there. Chaos and danger. Greedy, reckless adventures, and things that want to eat you. He turned around toward the village. Plain town is home, and home is safe. You know what's expected of you? Today's tomorrow, and the day after that, because nothing ever changes, and Bobby stopped short. Even as she said the word, she saw that something had, in fact, changed. Something catastrophic had happened. The tree, she said breathlessly. The hard oak. It's on fire. Chapter 3. The heart of the plain town was burning. As Bobby ran to the village, she could scarcely believe her eyes, but there was no denying it. The hard oak had consumed a pillar of fire. Hungry tendrils of orange and yellow flicked upward into the sky. Although not all those tendrils reached the skyward, Bobby could see the flames spreading toward the tree and the grass that surrounded it. Fire fanned along the ground. All of plain town was made of oak. Our homes will be flammable, Bobby cried. She turned to the shocked village who stood lining the road, watching the scene in mute horror. We have to do something. The villagers bleeding in panic. The, the could, what could any of them do? Bobby raked her brain. She mentally kicked herself for not thinking of the filler bucket of water back in the pond. And then she kicked herself again for not thinking of a single bucket of water could make a difference here. But what else did she have in her inventory? Some sticks, sugar cane, a few shaves of wheat, and dirt. She had a whole stack of dirt. Bobby sprang into action. She ran in circles around the town, a square piling dirt around her as she went. Grass could catch fire, but dirt would not. It would be a form of barrier between a blaze and the village's many buildings. Bobby had never seen so many grateful for dirt in all her life. When her barrier was complete, Bobby turned to the nearest villager, as Clark Every. Have you seen Johnny? He asked. Is he safe? Clark Every honked in confirmation and tipped his bald head to one side of the road. Johnny, for once, was still. He sat atop Goalie's shoulder, watching the fire alongside the cluster of villagers. Bobby joined them, squeezing Johnny's foot and slid up beside Goalie. Together, Bobby and her neighbor stood shoulder to shoulder, bearing silent witness to as the fire slowly burned itself out. The danger was the least was over, but the hard oak, which had stood longer than anyone could remember, was gone. Consumed. Bobby wondered if she would say something, a cast about their words of solace for wisdom, but they wouldn't come. The silence stretched on, heavy with sadness and shock, and then to her surprise, the stranger broke the silence. Dude, that was epic, said a boy. Way more dramatic than I expected. The stranger stepped through the throng and started villagers. 
right before through Bobby's makeshift barrier of dirt and toward the empty patch of charred ground where the tree had been. It wasn't just any stranger, Bobby realized. It was the stranger, the one she helped her the night before. She thought he left, but here he was, obviously fully recovered. He must be feeling better because he was grinning, grinning at the time like this. Excuse me, Bobby said, stepping toward and raising her voice above the whispered fretting of her neighbors. But what are you doing? The boy appeared to be in momentary startled. Whoa, you're real? He said. Not gonna lie, I kinda thought I hallucinated you. Bobby frowned. Of course I'm real, and, and I don't want to see rude, but I asked you a question. The boy, clearly less concerned about being rude, gave her a long, curious look. What are you, some kind of mutant nitwit? Excuse me, said the Bobby. No offense, said the boy, but Bobby was offended all of the same. It's just, you don't look like any kind of villager I've met. You sure don't sound like one, but you act like you live here or something. I do live here, she said. This is my home. The tree had stood here for generations. You you didn't have something to do with that fire, did you? Well, sure, said the boy. I started it. Bobby gasped his shock at the attitude of the information. How could you? It wasn't hard, he smirked. See? You just need flint and steel, and then you... No, Bobby said. No, I mean, why would you? Well, funny story, said the boy. Did you know that you can get charcoal from burning wood with in a furnace? What? Said Bobby. Charcoal, said the boy. It's useful for all sorts of things. You can create it if you burn wood in a furnace. But that's time-consuming. He turned away from her to look around the ground. I thought maybe I'd get a lot of charcoal really fast if I skipped the furnace and just set a big tree on fire. But nope. No such luck. He shrugged. Oops. Oops. Bobby echoed. She could scarcely believe it. There's coal right under our feet. If you dig any direction, you'll find more than you could ever use. And you... You destroyed an ancient tree we're all cherished so you can make a charcoal? And it didn't even work. Well, that's a melodramatic way to put it, the boy said Ghibli. But yeah, I guess. Bobby felt a wave of outrage develop in her chest, and she wasn't alone. At her back, the agitated voices of her neighbors rose in a cacophony of aggrieved tongues. Whoa, said the boy, chuckling. That doesn't sound good. What's got them all worked up? I think you better leave, said Bobby. I'm sorry, but you're not welcome here. This only made the boy laugh harder. As he had a wicked laugh, Bobby thought this sounded cool. I'm not ready to leave, he said. Not yet. I still got a lot of chests to loot. Some cheap this year, and I still think I saw a gold them around here. These things drop iron ingots, you know. Don't you dare hurt Goalie, Bobby said, and her voice was hard and cold as she could ever make it. The boy tittered. You named the golem? Wow, you're such a freak. And you've overstayed your welcome, said Bobby. Leave. I, I won't tell you again. Well, you... Tell you what, the boy said. Why don't you make me? And that, he drew a sword. It was the most intimidating weapon Bobby had ever seen, shaped out of diamond. It was an edge so thin it looked like it would slice the very air. A subtle purple aura come across as a glittering sky-length blue of the blade. Bobby took an involuntary step back, unsure what to do. In her momentary hesitation, a streak of movement and color flashed before her eyes. At first, she thought it was a sword, but it was Goalie. The Golem had leaped forward, stepping between him and the matching the massive fist into the boy, who stumbled back and fell to the ground. Bobby grasped, Goalie, no, don't hurt him. The boy looked furious. He glared up from the ground, gazing hatefully from Goalie to Bobby and back again. Fine, he said. I know when I'm not wanted, he stood, putting his sword away and dusting himself off, and Bobby could see where his armor was now dented. This stupid little village anyway. As the boy walked off, the gathered villagers parted and let him pass. He reached out of spite and knocked the hat right off the librarian clerk's head. Goalie tensed and he took up a step forward, but Bobby put a steadying hand on Gollum's elbow. They didn't need any more trouble. You'll be sorry, said the boy as he stepped off the road and into the plane. Sorry you treated me like this. Sorry you ever met me. Bobby didn't say uh, out loud, but as he turned to look at an empty space where the hard oak used to be, he thought, sorry to meet you. I already am. Chapter 4. Not far away from the deep underground, an aspiring hero named Ben realized that he'd been robbed. He met slept poorly, dreaming that he might be caught in a massive web. The sticky threads hummed and jostled, and Ben knew what he meant. Some monster spider was skittering somewhere nearby, but just out of sight, making it across the web, his mandible was dripping in the venomous saliva and approached him, hungry for flesh. He awoke, thrashing in his bed, tearing at his tangled sheets. It took him a long moment to realize there had only been a dream, but he was safe. A moment after that, he realized he was alone. He rose, puzzled over the absence of his friend. Logan? He called it, but quietly, fearfully attracting the wrong kind of attention, he decided he'd never retrieve his weapons before doing anything else. That's not good, he said. Peering into his bedside chest, it was more than he stashed all his valuables before heading down for the night. He had ores and ingots and redstone dust, potions and arrows and air arrows that had been treated with potions, a diamond pickaxe, an enchanted sword, and emeralds. A whole stack of beautiful glittering emeralds. It was gone now. All of it. Gone. Oh, that's really not good, he said again. Logan, he called. Buddy? He had to try. He wasn't expecting an answer. Really? Logan had just disappeared. His bed was gone, too. Packed up and hauled off with all of Logan's stuff. And yes, apparently all of Ben's stuff, too. Logan, he said, shrill this time. 
Something answered. It wasn't Logan. From the darkness, a harsh hissing sound that be set Ben's nerves on edge. He knew precisely what he was turned to face the sound. A creeper skulked toward him. Its eerie alien face was a mask of horror. A downturned mouth opened in a frozen, silent scream. Ben took an instinctive step forward, lifting his sword arm, which was empty, right? He followed through the swing anyway, striking the creeper with his bare hand. The mob faltered for a moment, knocked backward by the force of the blow, and Ben thought, I can do this. Then the creeper exploded. Ben felt a plane of the explosion and then a disorientation of being thrown off his feet. Grainy smoke filled his vision, and the ground beneath him seemed to disappear. He felt a short distance, taking even more damage upon landing. It took a few moments for Ben's head to clear. When it turned, he realized he'd been falling into a lower, darker cave. He was surrounded by a stony rubble left behind the creeper's explosion. One of the torches from the above had fallen by his foot. The explosion giving knocked it right out of the wall where he placed it right before. He snatched it off the ground and set it upright. A small halo in the light cast by the torch, Ben gathered up the loose stop blocks of stone. Aside from the armor he'd been wearing, he was slept in. The stone was all he had in the world, and his armor had seen better days. The simple iron breastplate was pitted with a pocket mark. It had probably saved his life just now, but it wouldn't take any more hits like that one. He was hurt, but worse than the physical pain, it was the knowledge that he'd been abandoned. He Ben didn't seem like this could happen. Logan had warned him about being needed to start pulling his weight in a partnership, and Ben had tried, hadn't he? He knew he had tried, but tried and failed, apparently. Ben's gloomy mustings were interrupted by a sound of growling in the darkness. Regrets and remorse would have to wait. Ben, between Ben and relative safety of the sunlight, were no noble number of monstrous knobs intended to tear him bit to bit. He was unarmed, under-equipped, and barely armored, and the only sources of light he had available him were torches that he and Logan had left behind the day before. Retracing their steps would be the best chance of surviving, and perhaps of reuniting with his lost friend. In his plan, anyway, he would then love his odds, but he got out of this alive, he'd be a pretty great story to tell, and maybe that would be enough to prove Logan once and for all that Ben had took what it took to be a hero like him. And that's the end of that. I apologize, though, for I've spread misinformation like I used to. So what this should have said, actually, was chapters one to four. So I'm sorry about that. So now what we're going to do is next time we're going to read chapter or pages 22 to, let's see, I have it written down, 41 which doesn't tell me anything about uh, the chapters. But what I do know is we're reading from chapter five to chapter, oh, let's see, 41. Boop. Chapter five to chapter seven. Chapter 5 to chapter 7, another simple, actually this is 19 pages actually, if you want to put it more into a perspective that makes more sense. But yep, that is the first episode done, so we are already one tenth of the way done with this book. There is 206 pages, so all I have to do is do that 10 times and well, we'd be done. But that would take about 200 minutes and I don't have 200 minutes. I mean, I do, but still. Anyways, I hope you guys have a super fantastic, wonderful day. If you like me, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I already know it's the next book we're going to read after this one, even. So that's very fun, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Hope you enjoy the book.